Okay, so here you guys will see a representation of what you see in that PDF that I sent you guys last night on how we're going to subset our real numbers, how we're going to break them down into smaller and smaller sets that have more specific properties. The definition for real numbers, the one that you can write right above that chart if you'd like to, real numbers are any numbers that have a decimal representation. If there is some way that you can think of to write a number with some number of decimal places, whether it goes on forever or not, that must be a real number. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, obviously they're all real numbers. They have decimal representations, 1.0, 2.0, et cetera. But things like three sevenths, which is a weird decimal that repeats forever, is a real number. Pi, 3.14159, repeats or doesn't repeat for but continues forever, is still a real number. It is something that exists. So when you guys see this little drawing on your papers, this rectangle divided into two sections, what this means is that everything in this box is representing the real number system. We represent it with a capital R. We try to make it bold, but the way the easiest to do that is just to write another vertical line, whether you do it like this or whether you do it like this. It doesn't matter, but you get to see sort of what the point is. You may have seen this when you did domain and range back in Algebra 2. We take those real numbers and we divide them into slightly smaller sets. And you guys will notice split right down the middle here, saying we're about to take our real numbers and split them into two separate parts, two the distinct parts where there is no overlap. This isn't a Venn diagram. This is just saying there's some stuff here and some stuff here. And that's where you guys will see rational numbers and irrational numbers as your next two words. We are gonna talk about how to split these things up in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and write out those definitions so we don't have to waste time on seeing you write them. Rational numbers are all numbers that can be represented by the fraction a over b, where both a and b are integers. We'll more clearly define them in just a minute, but basically integers are what you consider to be your whole numbers, positive and negative. So negative 5, negative 20, negative 15 positive 37, positive 81, whatever. All of those are integers. And as long as we have some integer divided by some integer, we have ourselves a rational number. Rational is gonna be what I put on this side here, but you'll notice we've already used the capital letter R for our real numbers. Rational numbers get a slightly different letter. Uh, it is the capital Q that we'll use here. And again, here's how I can make it look like it's bolded by drawing that extra vertical line. Why Q? Well, A over B, also known as A divided by B, is a quotient. And the Q actually comes from the Italian word for quotient, which also begins with a Q. So that is why. This is a division step. All fractions are division steps, and they have a quotient. So that's where that capital Q comes from. And on the other side over here, we'll have our irrational numbers. Well, guys, you can see it's split into two distinct pieces here. If a number is not rational, but it's still a number you can possibly think of, it must be irrational. So really, yeah, they are the uh, real numbers that aren't rational. Another way of thinking about it, and that's more focusing on the properties of what irrational numbers are, irrational numbers never repeat. They continue on forever, never ending, without repeating along the way. Now, the most famous of our irrational numbers, of course, is pi. 3.14159265355, et cetera, et cetera, goes on forever, never repeats along the way. Others, for example, the square root of two, 1.414 something, but then it continues with various numbers that are not just 414141 for the rest of time. Same thing with the square root of three, 1.732, continues on for a while after that. Also an irrational number, I'm going to write up here. Radical 5 over 2. Please be very careful in thinking about this. You'll notice I said that this can be represented by the fraction a over b for rational numbers, where a and b are integers. Just because you have a fraction, though, does not mean that it is a rational number. If there is some irrational component to it, then that means that I can't do it anymore. When you guys had radians as part of trigonometry last year, 
you have something like pi over 3. Well, since pi is an irrational number, it's not an integer, it's certainly not something that I'm able to divide by 3. So, situations like this, yeah, those are going to be a little bit weirder and a little bit trickier. Irrational numbers, in terms of their letter, that one's easy. It's just the letter I. If you really wanted to try to bold it, great, but it's not totally necessary. Our next set of numbers that we're going to talk about are integers. Now, you know the integers just sort of based on having used them for the last several years. Negatives, zero, positive numbers that are what we would consider whole numbers. We'll have a more specific definition for that in just a second. But integers, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all of that stuff. We want a more specific mathematical definition for that? Well, here's the thing. Every single integer that you can think of, 1, 2, negative 5, whatever, can be expressed as a rational number. All integers still have that form a over b. All integers are rational numbers but they have one very specific component. They're rational numbers when b is equal to 1. Because what happens when we divide something by 1? What happens when we divide a, which is an integer, by 1? Uh, it's just itself. So we're kind of using the word in its own definition here, but you guys understand what integers are as a basic system. Integers are a subset of our rational numbers. So that's why you guys will see I have a circle drawn in here, and we'll be able to put our integer letter in, up in here. Problem, we just used the i for irrational numbers. So what are we supposed to do now for integers? This one's even weirder. This is the letter z. And again, I bold it by doing that extra line, but why the letter z of all things for integers? We're not just picking the biggest scrabble tiles we can here. Uh, this one actually comes from German. Q came from the Italian word for quotient. Z comes from the German word for numbers. Zahlen, I think. I'm not exactly sure, but whoever takes or has taken German can clarify that for me. So that capital Z we will use to represent our integer system. For our last two types of sets, whole numbers and natural numbers, you'll notice two very similar definitions that I give here. Whole numbers are non-negative integers. Natural numbers are positive integers. Doesn't this mean the same thing? Doesn't non-negative imply that we have to have positive integers? Not exactly, because you're forgetting one very important number that is not negative, but is also not positive. Whole numbers start at zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, and continues forever. But again, non-negative. So we don't have any of the integers to the left here, negative one, negative two, none of that. Those are just integers, not whole numbers. Natural numbers being Positive integers means we kiss the zero goodbye. So just one, two, three, four, and continuing on forever in that regard. So the way that we write that in our Venn diagram, you guys see two more circles in there. Whole numbers are a subset of our integers. Yes, these have their own letters because there's no W and no N that we use for anything else. And the natural numbers are a subset of our whole numbers. The only difference between your whole numbers and your natural numbers is whether you can use zero or not. So before we move on to our next page, there is just one more thing I do want to talk about with rational numbers. Uh, you see again the definition here, a over b, where a and b are both integers, but I specify that b cannot equal zero. Now, you may think that you already know why that is, but let's just go over it. Why it is that that has to be the case? So I'm just going to say, why can't we do divided by zero? Why can't we take some number and, you know, let's pick for a just some other integer that's not zero. So some non-zero number that we're going to divide by zero. If you try this in a calculator, it gives you an error. If you try to do this in real life, you create a black hole. It's not possible. So we say that it is undefined. You cannot split a non-zero number of things into zero pieces. But, what happens if we try a scenario where we break all the rules? Where we say that a is zero and b is zero. Well, what would the rational number zero divided by zero look like? 
I'm actually going to let you guys take a couple of minutes and think about this on your own, and I'll ask you a couple of options for what you think this value is supposed to represent. Okay, so hopefully, as a class, we just came up with a few different options for us here. We can get zero if we say, well, zero divided into any number of pieces is still zero. We can say one if we say, hey, zero divided by itself, well, any number divided by itself, we've always been told is one. We can also say, oh, wait, we're dividing by zero. We just said that was undefined. Why should this be any different? All of these have a basis in mathematics for being correct, which is why for the case of zero divided by zero, we don't just say it's undefined. We say that it cannot be determined. We say that it is indeterminate. We're going to use that word a lot more towards the end of this class when we get towards calculus, and you'll use indeterminate forms in calculus a lot more. But the idea that zero divided by zero actually doesn't have one specific word or answer that we can use mathematically is a little bit weird. This is one of those higher level math concepts that you guys are going to now be trying to wrap your heads around as we approach calculus at the end of this year. So now we're going to do a quick recap of something that you guys probably did when you did domain and range in Algebra 2, and that's interval notation, a way to represent a group of, in this case, mostly real numbers that span a large interval of the entire number line. So how we can write that in a much smaller form, because obviously we can't list out every single real number that exists. An interval notation means we're talking about some sort of interval in this case where let's just say x is between a and b. When we have an interval, we're talking about some maybe bounded region, which means I need to talk about what happens on the low end of that region and the high end of that region. Well, if we have an inequality written like this, we know a is the smallest value that it could possibly go to and b is the largest. Our interval, interval notation, notation is something comma something, and then around it, we're going to put, well, it depends on the signs. If we have less than signs, we do not have equality, we'll put parentheses around it, so this kind of looks like a coordinate point. But if I was to change just this and say that a is less than or equal to x, I no longer use a parenthesis. I use a bracket. We have some specific words for this. Um, if we are saying that there is a bracket here, it means that A is inclusive. It is included in the interval. A is, in fact, less than or equal to A, so X can be the letter A. Whereas over here, if we have a parenthesis, well, the opposite of inclusive is exclusive. We are excluding B from the possibility because B cannot be less than itself. So this is just going to tell us Basically, do we have equality or do we not have equality? And we'll get to a couple more specific things, how we use those, in these next five examples. So the first three of our examples are fairly straightforward. Just x is less or greater than 2, x is greater than or equal to 2, x is less than a. And we'll talk about each of these, how they're different. We'll start off with x is greater than 2. Again, for an interval, we want to talk about the lowest possible bound of that interval and the highest. So, if x is a number greater than 2, that means I can't have anything smaller than 2 on the left side here. So 2 is going to be the first number that we write because it is the smallest part of this interval. We just have to now say, okay, now how far up can I go? I can go to a million. A million is greater than 2. I can go to a billion. A billion is greater than 2. And I can continue adding zeros forever and ever and ever until we get to infinity. So, yeah, this never ends. This number line continues on to the right forever and ever. Great. We had just got done saying if 2 is greater than 2, that doesn't work, so we have an exclusive thing here. Infinity, whenever we use it in interval notation, is always exclusive because we don't know a specific value that it is. That's what the definition of infinity is. It's some ridiculously large number that goes on forever and ever and gets bigger and bigger. How is this next example any different? Not really. We still have 2 as the smallest possible value. We still have infinity as the largest. And infinity, again, is always exclusive. But if you see a straight line in this inequality, you see a straight line making this bracket. So again, the only difference between this and this is 
equality. How about x is less than a? Well, here let's think of it this way. If x is a value less than a, you can even look at the way the arrow is pointing. We're going to the left. We're not talking about anything any bigger than a. So it turns out in this case, a is our upper bound. No equality means we will have a parenthesis here. Let's pick a value for a. It does not matter. Let's say a is 0. Cool. Where are my x values going to be that are less than 0? They are negative 2, negative 70, negative 3 million, and continues on forever and ever. But when we write infinity on this end, we do include the negative sign. So yes, negative infinity does exist. While we don't have a specific number for it, and while it is still exclusive, it's not a specific number, we can say, okay, this is what happens when you go the other way forever and ever and ever. For our last two examples, we switch things up a little bit. 4 is less than or equal to, sorry, negative 4 is less than or equal to x is less than 15. This looks a lot like that example that I had just put up here when we first talked about what an interval was. So you guys can probably tell if x is between these two signs, x is between these two numbers, we're talking about negative 4 being on the low end, we're talking about 15 being on the high end. The only thing that's difficult about this is remembering what your end parentheses or brackets have to look like. We see equality, we put a bracket. We see inequality, we see no equal there, equal to sign, we say it's exclusive. And then we get down to this scenario, where x is greater than 5 or x is less than or equal to negative 2. Real quickly, if we were to put that on a number line, those are the situations that look like this, where I've got some part of my solutions going this way and some part of my solutions going this way. But x is all of those values combined. So we need a way to express these things. So let's just treat these two separately for right now. If we just had x is greater than 5, 5 is clearly the smallest that I have on this number line, and it continues forever. So I'll say I can go from 5 to infinity. There is no equal sign, which is why I've written a parenthesis. And we have to deal with this negative 2 as well. Now, why did I push the 5 and the infinity all the way that way? Because I knew at some point I was going to have to talk about negative 2, and that's a smaller number than negative 5. It's going to be on the left. This arrow continues forever and ever to the left, and therefore hits negative infinity. But we do have equality for this one, so we say that it can equal negative 2. That's why we have the closed bracket. When we have an OR situation, when we have a combination of intervals, we don't just list them separately. We don't just pick one or the other. Every single value in here and every single value in here is a possible value of x that would make the statement true. In order for us to link those together, we're going to use the letter u, or at least it looks like it. It's a very weird, narrow parabola, and it is called the union of these intervals. The idea that I'm taking this thing and this thing and saying this is one big set. Even though there's this giant missing gap, I can still say that the union of two intervals is my entire set of possible x values. It looks a little bit weirder to be sure, but it is certainly something that we're allowed to have. Now, we've used the word set a lot already in this video. I want to talk about what a set of numbers looks like when we try to write it out. You guys have probably seen these sort of shapes before. We call these braces rather than brackets. And whenever I put a list of numbers inside a set of brackets, that represents a set. Now, some of our sets can be finite. I can say this stops at 5. This entire set of numbers has only four numbers in it, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's less interesting for us than the ones that are infinite. That if this continued on forever and ever and ever, whenever you see those three dots, that ellipsis, that means that we are continuing forever and ever and ever. There are not just four numbers in this set. There's an infinite number of numbers in this set. When we come up with set builder notation, we want a way to represent every single number that we see in this list. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to draw something that looks a lot like a set. We're going to say, I want to talk about all x values that exist. 
in this set. So I will say the set of all x, this is what this side means, the set of all x. This line right here is called a pipe if we really want to be technical, but more important to you guys is what it means. And it means these two words. The set of all values of x such that we now need to come up with conditions for what x is. So we have the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. going on forever. Well, that means I want to say, well, what are my x values going to look like? I know they need to be bigger than 2. And since 2 is part of the set, I even need to say that they equal 2. X is a number greater than 2. Awesome. So here is the rationale, the actual equation or inequality that will represent, okay, here's how all these numbers exist. The one thing that we have left to say is what kind of numbers, in this case, x is allowed to be. x can't just be any real number. Pi is greater than 2, but you don't see that in this list, and you never will. So we need to say that x can only be the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., etc. x cannot be anything except one of our whole numbers, or integers, or natural numbers. As it turns out, we could use any of those right now. But to be more specific, all of these numbers are positive. So I can say this. This is my condition. And you'll notice I drew this little weird E in here. It's a Greek letter, actually, epsilon. And basically, it is saying what x belongs to. x belongs to the natural numbers. 2, 3, 4, 5, all of those values are natural numbers. So this is how a set builder notation will often look. Your x such that, this first part's never going to change. The second part's going to change a lot. The third part will always say what x belongs to, but it may be natural numbers, it may be integers, it may be whole numbers. It could be real numbers, and we'll see an example of that, but you'll also see why we wouldn't use that. We use interval notation instead. All right, so here you'll see the first three examples that I have at the bottom of this page. You'll notice this set looks a lot like the one that we just did as our example, except this time we are starting at 8 and going down 7, 6, 5, 4. This continues on forever, right? So let's talk about that. Again, all of our set builder notations are going to start the same way. The set of all x values such that 8 is the largest number that I can have here. After that, 7, 6, 5, 4, it continues to go downward. So we'll say that x is less than or equal to 8. Why equal to? Because there's an 8 there. All we have to now decide on is what set or subset, rather, of the real numbers x belongs to. Think about what happens if this continues on forever. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. As soon as we see those negatives in there, we're not talking about our natural numbers anymore. We're not talking about our whole numbers anymore. We're talking about our integers. So. Here's where we have our capital Z to say, yep, this only works if x is an integer, but it has to be integers. We don't just stop, the, like if this was x is less than or equal to 8 in the natural numbers, our lowest number in this would be 1 and we'd stop. Down here, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 continuing on forever. You guys can notice the pattern very quickly. How would we write this in interval or set builder notation though? Uh, there's not really an inequality that works for this, if you think about it. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. I can't say x is greater than 3 because, well, I'd have to include the 4 and the 5 and the 7 and the 8 if I was talking about integers or natural numbers or anything like that. I need some way to represent what this pattern is. And obviously, 3 times 1, 3 times 2, 3 times 3, 3 times 4, 3 times 5, going on forever. We are allowed in set builder notation to say that x is equal not just to a number or less than or equal to a number, but equal to an expression. 
we're going to take 3 and multiply it by some number. And depending on what that number is, we'll come up with some number in the set. But now, we're not worried about what value x belongs to. We are limited now by what n belongs to. So here's a major difference. If we're going to include this expression as part of our set builder notation, n is now a part of this. What are my possible values of n to make this set? 3 times 1, 3 times 2, 3, 4, 5. Essentially, what number in this pattern are we talking about? Since 1 is our smallest n value, we will say that this is just the natural numbers. And in fact, if we said the whole numbers here, we'd be wrong, because 0 is not part of this set, and 3 times 0 would give me 0. So rather than saying x is a part of, really, it'll depend on the situation. We might not use x for our belongs to. We might use another letter. I picked n because it works easily. You're welcome to do that. And yeah, you might see something where you have a lowercase n and an uppercase n next to each other. Try not to freak out. This third example, though, all multiples of 5. How's that any different from what we just did? We said this was 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. It's 3 times a number. The problem is all multiples of 5 includes numbers that you wouldn't necessarily think of immediately, like negative 10. Is negative 10 a multiple of 5? You bet when you multiple it by negative 2. When I say all multiples, I can have the negative values as well. And 5 times 0 is 0. So for this set here, it's going to look very similar to what we had above because, well, these two sets look very similar. We're going to talk about 5 times some number n. That's what a multiple means. But this time, because we can have negative values, because we can have 0 as a value of this set, we wouldn't say that n is part of the natural numbers. Now we have to go back to integers. So n can be a negative number, and that would give us the negative multiples of 5, and can also be 0, which would give us just a 0 for our part of this set. So please be careful with that. Just because these two look very similar, there's one major difference involved. Our final example, we want to take our set builder notation and represent the inequality x is greater than 6. So, like we've said, anytime you start with set builder notation, the set of all x such that, I need a way to represent all the numbers bigger than 6. You know what that way is? The set of all values where x is greater than 6. All right, um, well, what values of x am I allowed to have? Am I allowed to just only have integers here? No, I can have 6.5, I can have 6.374, whatever. I can have, I don't know, pi times 3, get some number a little bit bigger than 9. So x can be any number that we want it to be. If it's a number that we can make into a decimal approximation, then it works. So yeah, x would be part of the real numbers here. Why don't we want to use set builder notation in the real numbers? Well, remember what this would look like in interval notation. x is greater than 6. So 6 is the smallest thing we can have, and infinity is the largest. Exclusive on both sides because there's no equality and it's infinity, and we're done. So the choice becomes, would you rather represent a set of real numbers like this, or would you rather represent it like this? And this is why we decide on interval notation in these cases. It is something that you will also use so much more frequently when you get into calculus and the like. So that does it for this particular thing. We'll reconvene. We'll talk about where you're going to go from here.